So, um, and my presentation today is on decentralized mixers in Bitcoin, and specifically how to dispense with the trust of third party. So, um, before I start, just uh, a bit about myself. I'm a master's student at the University of Montreal, and with supervision on that. And when I started my master's, I was interested in um, prizing the digital world in general. I didn't know about Bitcoin, and uh, suddenly through my master's, I, I read about Bitcoin first, and I thought, wow, this is, uh, this is really interesting. But what really caught my attention and, and my curiosity was just how anonymous is Bitcoin. And it turns out really that Bitcoin is not anonymous. I'm not going to go into detail of why this is the case because that was quite well um, explained by the zero point presentation uh, this morning. Um, but I mean, there's, a few, uh, there's a few papers that really do point towards the idea that for uh, most users, the middle of Bitcoin um, all, is not anonymous at all. There's just so many ways that personal identification, identification you think um, whenever you're entering or exiting the Bitcoin network, say you buy your first coins, so you need to mine them. So you buy your first coins, you go to your exchange, and now your exchange knows the correspondence between the address you have and, and uh, something about you, uh, some, some information about you in the same way when you're exiting the network. Also, if you put up an address on your web page or your blog or some forums, uh, for donations, well then that person then is associated with your address. So it's easy to have your first address or addresses um, identified like that, be anonymized. Now you might think, okay, so, so we have a user analysis here that has address A1 that is associated with her, and she does not want that to be the case. So she'll um, just think, all right, well, uh, I'll empty my entire address A1 and send it to A2, and then nobody will be able to find me. But of course, that's not true because, well, people will just know that, okay, the entire address is empty, but you probably still belongs to Alice. So, really, in this case, you know, anonymity is gained. Now, um, you might think this is way too simple. Let's do something more complicated. Let's split the input in half, um, and then send half to one side, half to the other, split them again, rejoin them. Now, it does happen that with network analysis, it's actually pretty easy to find those, uh, those cases and to retrace. Um, well, actually, you know that all these addresses actually belong to the same person. Now, um, I find this problematic for many reasons that were well, mostly explained in the zero talk point, uh, in the, the zero coin talk. Um, and uh, so, so I won't go too much into it, but I, I just personally I find, I find it quite uh, scary that when a credit card is able to guess what my next purchase will be. So I really think that's something that we do not want to use. But I'm not the first person to be interested in there and, and, and doing that, and there have appeared over the years um, decentralized, uh, centralized pardon, mixers uh, that are also called laundry services. And these mixers work in the following way. First of all, they receive public input and private output addresses. So on the left, we have the public input addresses of Alice, Bob, and Charlie. That those addresses are considered contaminated and not anonymous. And, um, these parties are going to give the mixer new addresses on the right that are not publicly associated with them at this point. And so the mixer is going to receive coins from the public input addresses, it's going to mix the coins, and send the mixed coin back to the output addresses. Um, so an example you could do here is um, send a mixer could send Alice's coins to Charlie, Bob's coins to Alice, and Charlie's coins to Bob. And so the idea here is that if you're looking at the blockchain, uh, you only see that the address A1 sends to address on the, the right, but of course the C2 handle is unknown. So um, yeah, so it would be hard to guess really to whom the addresses on the right belong. Of course, three addresses like that is very yeah, insufficient. You would expect uh, well, dozens or even hundreds of people to participate in such a missing transaction. Now, you have to realize here that Mixer did create this permutation, this mix, and thus knows the correspondence between the addresses of uh, each of the parties. So we'll be able to be anonymous as a party there. Now, the model that we're looking at here is a restricted model of the Mixer, and uh, it works on the idea that, uh, on the assumptions that the number of input and output addresses must be the same here, which is not all the case in real Mixers, and also that the number of bitcoins makes them the same. Now imagine this were not the case, it would be really easy to say Alice is the only one here that has, say, seven bitcoins that goes as an input. Of course, she's going to want to receive seven 
the coins as an output. So anybody that's looking at the blockchain can just see, all right, seven outputs on uh, seven inputs on the left, seven inputs on the left, seven inputs on the left, seven inputs on the output on the right. This is definitely the same person. So that really defeats the point. We don't want that to happen. So standardized um, sizes that we really looking at here. Now, I find it quite ironic that the Bitcoin network was really built on the idea that you do not need to trust anyone. You don't need to trust the bank, you don't need to trust the Fed, you don't need to you know, trust an escrow and, and so you can really do everything on your own, except if you want to be anonymous. And if you want to be anonymous, you have to trust the mixer. Uh, I think this situation is problematic um, for, for two main reasons. First of all, is the mixer can just move your coins, because if you give your coins, I mean, your transaction from Alice to the mixer, well, um, and uh, the mixer can just uh, disappear, and of course, if, uh, if you don't know who that uh, the, the, the mixer is, and can't go knock on your door, you've lost your coins. Now, I'm not aware of this happening before um, on for, for mixers, but it has happened for, for a lot of them. Um, Exchanges uh, and other Bitcoin centralized services. And the second downside we have here is that the mixer does no correspondence between the addresses. So you're gaining no anonymity with respect to the mixer or with respect to anyone that's excluding the mixer. So say the mixer is okay, he's a good guy, and, but then um, your criminal group or the FBI or whatever comes knocking at the mixer's door and says, uh, and we want to know the correspondence of Alice's address. Well, then the mixer might be, uh, might be forced to cooperate. And with those problems in mind, we can wonder if things can be done differently, and it appears that they can. So the idea here is we want to take out the centralized mixer and that trusted third party, and we want to replace it using multi party computation. Now, in the general case, what multi party computation does is it removes the need of trusted third party from and protocol. So, so it, 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 it really looks like magic. And the downside is it tends to be quite expensive in terms of uh, computing power and number of exchanges that people need to do. So we'll be looking at that, how, how we can use this. And we want to use it to uh, get users to work together to make some points without the centralized entity. And of course, we want to keep the property that the output addresses are unlinked to the input addresses. So just to compare, if, if we look at the centralized mixer or the decentralized mixer, well, of course, users are going to get together. In the centralized case, they have to physically do, well, not physically, but do a transaction from their own accounts to the mixer, whereas in the decentralized case, there's no such thing. They always keep control over their coins. Um, in the centralized case, the mixer will choose a permutation, whereas this permutation is chosen by the users in some secure fashion in the decentralized case. And of course, um, well, if the mixer is honest, we'll get back the coins and it works on the other side too. But uh, centralized case, in centralized case, the users are not anonymous with respect to the mixer, whereas they are anonymous with respect to everyone, even the other users in the decentralized case. So, how do you do this? Well, there's two approaches that uh, I've been working on. The first one um, is I call the transaction blueprint, and it works in the following way. So, so what we want is to find, somehow, we want to find a way to, uh, for the users to choose a secure permutation. And when is that? We want to choose a permutation without the users knowing that the address addresses on the right, who they correspond to. So, they, of course, the addresses are going to be known, because anyways it's going to be known in the transaction on the blockchain, but the correspondence between those addresses and the users on the left must stay unknown. Now, uh, what the users are going to do is choose this permutation somehow. Uh, one user proposes a transaction, or it can be another party, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So it proposes, say, this permutation here. Um, and then if everybody, every party checks that this transaction is honest, that is, you want to make sure that you're not putting in coins and never receiving them at the end, or having less coins and so forth and so on. Um, and then if, if the transaction is good, is honest, the parties will sign the transaction and it's just sent out to the network as, as any transaction would be. So um, this is one approach. Now the hard part is how to build this, uh, this permutation in a secure manner. And there's two ways that I've been proposed before. The first one was by um, Manny Rosenfeld, that is here with us this weekend. And he called it, well, he used cumulative encryption.